Vikings, as the late Iron Age Scandinavians are known today, left a permanent mark in history. They have risen to newfound fame in today's world through popular culture, fascinating people across the globe with their gods, myths, and sagas. Widely featured in movies, video games, and TV series, Viking religion is often portrayed in a simplified manner that can be quite far from the truth. Stories about their gods and myths are also offered online and offline, sometimes owing more to wishful thinking than solid academic research. All these different sources can make it very hard to get closer to the truth of what went on in the Viking mind. Viking Age religion and worldview is a very complex subject, so we met with Professor Neil Price of Uppsala University, who is a leading specialist in the Viking Age and the pre-Christian religions of the North. He is a distinguished professor of archaeology and currently directs a major Swedish research council project on the Viking phenomenon. Professor Price is also the author of The Viking Way that focuses on the pre-Christian Norse religion and magic based on both literary and archaeological studies. It is considered by many as one of the most important contributions to Viking studies. You will now get a glimpse into what went on in the Viking mind. Their worldview, the importance of ancestors, the nature of their religion, gods, and the invisible population around them. We will take you to old Uppsala, a mythical place of kings and gods, and to Valsjärde, one of the most important burial sites of the time and age. We will also bust three common myths about the Vikings. The study of Old Norse religion, the ritual, spiritual life of the Vikings, is a massive subject. Hundreds of scholars have studied it for at least two centuries. It's hard to summarise, to, to, to get an overview of it, mainly because it's so complex, it's so varied. There is no single religion to get a grip on. But what we can do is take a deeper dive in particular aspects of it to explore these different expressions of the Viking mind. One of the most fundamental questions is, where does it come from? How old is the belief system of the Vikings? There are images on rock carvings engraved into the rocks of Scandinavia from the Bronze Age, so we're talking thousands of years before the time of the Vikings, that superficially resemble some of the gods, some of the, the, the heroes of the later myths, so a, a, a large humanoid figure with what looks like a hammer, a, a huge person with a spear, those kinds of things. Is that Thor? Is that Odin? We simply don't know. But it's clear that at least some of the stories of the gods and so on go back further than the time of the Vikings. There seem to be elements of Roman religion, perhaps even the religion of the Greeks, that have filtered into these ideas that were circulating in the north in the Iron Age. This is not surprising. Scandinavia was intimately connected with the continent far back in time. Scandinavian soldiers worked as mercenaries for the Romans and brought back ideas and objects and beliefs with them to their homelands when they returned. There's been this constant flow of information, of perspectives, of views of the world. And it's not, it's not surprising if these things end up in a kind of mishmash. So there's little bits of this and that that you can find in Norse religion that has come from other places. But in the end, as an overall package, if you like, it is something distinctly uh, northern. It's clear that some aspects of Viking belief are very, very old indeed. Just to take one example, something that literally ties it all together, the world tree. This is Yggdrasil, the steed of the terrible one. It, it refers to, to Odin. This is a great ash tree that links all the different parts of the Norse worlds together. So Asgard, where the gods live, Midgard, our world, Jotunheim, where the giants live, 
Utgard, Hel, and all of these others, they're joined together by the branches and the roots of the tree. There, there are um, creatures that live on the trunk and run up and down. There is uh, a well at the root where, they, where the Norns live, the, the, the women who decide the fate of humans and others. So it's, it's this world tree that links the, the, the Norse um, conception of the universe together. There's an Icelandic scholar who thinks this might actually be the Milky Way. If, you, uh, if you've ever been fortunate enough to, to escape the light pollution of our cities and see a really clear night sky, the Milky Way can, can fill the, the, the heavens with a, a kind of enormous band of, of cloudy light. Uh, it, it's not hard to see this as the tree. But the idea of a single column, a pillar, a support that holds up the universe is found in culture after culture across the northern world. So many, in fact, that there isn't any direct connection between them um, going back millennia. In other words, it's a very, very old idea, perhaps even going back to the early Stone Age. That's something that has certainly survived into the worldview of the Vikings. You find it among the Sami and others of their neighbours as well. So this is just one of, of many elements that have come together um, to build this uniquely Viking view of the world. Another question concerns how did the Vikings relate to this other world or other worlds and their inhabitants? How did they get in touch with them? How did they talk to them, communicate? We're used in our religions of today to holy buildings, churches, mosques, synagogues, whatever, along with holy books and holy men and holy women who interpret them. The Vikings had nothing like that. Their relationship with, this, with, the, with the others, the supernatural others, if you like, was very personal. There were certainly intermediaries. There were ritual specialists, for want of a better word, people who took charge of casting lots or casting the runes, things like that. But nonetheless, people had a very direct relationship with this world. There is something called blot. It, it means uh, it's sometimes translated as sacrifice, but that doesn't really capture it. It's a transaction. It's a negotiation. You uh, usually perform this with, with some kind of animal offering. Um, the blood is sprinkled using a twig or a bowl, something like that. We don't know much about the details. But in some way, it's, it's a gesture of, of respect and of... Uh, perhaps a, a request, uh, a request for um, better times or an outcome that you might want, something like that. Something that's very clearly important, really at the heart of this, is, it's hard to find a word for it, the, the, the Scandinavian, the Old Norse word for it, was seither. It means something like magic or sorcery. And it seems to be similar to what anthropologists later called shamanism. Uh, a set of rituals and practices that involved sending out the soul of the performer, um, sending out the spirit to ask questions or to communicate with the other worlds, with, with the, their inhabitants, um, to pursue a particular set of objectives. Imagine um, the, the performer of Seder, the sorcerer, if you like, as a kind of engineer, and the different kinds of Norse magic as tools in a toolkit to get the job done. And it's those people, almost all of whom were women, uh, who were the primary communicators between the Vikings and this other world. A tremendously important job at the centre of the community. The Norse creation myth is incredibly complicated and hugely contradictory. It really embodies the problems of studying Norse mythology, where you have lots of different stories that um, are not compatible at all. They're, they're, they make no coherent sense. 
at the end of this, there is at least clearly two families of gods, the Aesir and the Vanir. The Vanir seem to be older. These are gods that include uh, Freya, uh, the goddess, and her brother Freyr. Whether the, the Vanir are a relic of a, an earlier set of beliefs or the beliefs of another people, those are just two theories, we don't know. After a time, after a war actually, they combine with the Aesir gods, this is the gods of Odin and Thor, um, to form a general family that also seems to be generally called the Aesir. And it's this family of gods that uh, we find throughout Norse mythology. At the end of the war between the divine families, one figure comes to the fore, Odin often said to be the lord of the gods, the highest gods. It's, it's not quite true, but he's clearly a very, very prominent figure, a complicated figure, a being of contradictions, quite a guy. At the heart of what Odin is, what makes him who he is, is the life of the mind, knowledge, wisdom, and the quest for those things, and not least the price he has to pay in order to get them. Most of the tales about Odin concern this search for truth, for the, for the inner realities behind the surface, whether he's buying the, the gifts of poetry, whether he's seeing into the future, whether he's working out what will happen at the end of the world, what will happen to his son, why is his son Balder so disturbed with nightmares. All of these things in their different ways represent Odin's ultimate quest to know it all with a clear-eyed recognition of what that is going to cost. Something very special at the heart of the Viking mind. Today we talk about the Norse myths. We can buy collections of them in our bookshops, conveniently put together in a package that tells us about Norse religion. But the thing is, for the Vikings, they didn't know they had Norse myths. What they had was a collection of stories, a living world of tales, that changed and shifted from one teller to the next. And we've kind of fossilized that into a, a concrete form in, in, a, in our books, simply because that's what survived to us. But at the time, it was much more organic, a, a, a wonderfully varied world. And they lived inside that world of stories, depicting it on the walls of their buildings, in, in tapestries, in carvings, in their art, on their skin, everything. Everything around them was part of what we would call religion, but for them was everyday life. When we think about the great cult sites of the Vikings, the, the ritual centers of the North, one of them is more famous than all the others, Gamla Uppsala, Old Uppsala, where we are now. It's mentioned in a lot of sources from the Middle Ages and onwards and some of the sagas and so on, but there's one description above all that is at the center of, of what we know about this place. It's come down to us from a German cleric called Adam of Bremen, who was writing in about 1070. So it's quite late at the very end of the Viking Age. And it's one of the things that makes his description so remarkable because this is a century or more since Denmark and Norway converted to Christianity. But here in central Sweden, paganism appears to still be in full swing. What Adam describes is a whole suite of different activities. There is a sacred grove, there is the sacrifice of animals and humans, there's a holy well, there's all kinds of cult buildings, there are um, enormous ceremonies that happen every few years, every nine years, um, lots of things like this. One of the, uh, the, the most striking parts of his description is the central temple building. And it's from this that a kind of myth of Viking temples has grown up. According to him, it was a, a great structure entirely covered in gold with the idols of uh, Odin, Thor and Freyr inside. Where was this temple? Did it actually exist? People have looked at it for, for, for a century or more. 
There was an idea that it must be under the church, the medieval church built in the centre of the site, because wasn't it logical that the church would, would stand on the place where this great cult building had once been? When the church was excavated in the 1920s, there were different kinds of post holes found under the floor. And everyone started playing a game where you can join the dots of these things and, and uh, put together all kinds of, of strange uh, buildings. The problem is that these post holes are from different periods in time. So you can't join them up to make any kind of coherent building. We simply don't know what was underneath the church. Was there a, a cult site there or not? But there is a clue in Adam's description of the, the Uppsala temple. He's writing in Latin, and the word he uses for the space where the idols of the gods are kept is triclinium. And that word means dining room. And bear in mind, Adam is translating uh, into Latin. Presumably, it's something like a feasting hall. And one of the things we know is here at Gamla Uppsala is the great feasting hall of the Uppsala kings. This is a replica of one from Lyra in Denmark. It's kind of Denmark's equivalent of Gamla Uppsala, but the appearance is quite similar. And one of the ideas that's coming through a lot now that it's finding a very wide acceptance among researchers is that actually it's the feasting halls themselves that are the holy buildings of the Vikings. Where you have the, the kings and the, and the rulers of the halls holding court here, part of their function is as the representatives of the gods on earth. In other words, it's within the feasting halls of the lords that these ceremonies are taking place. So it may be that it's the Gamla Uppsala Hall, effectively a kind of palace itself, that is the building that Adam is describing. He has lots of um, rather lurid details, perhaps not lurid enough. Uh, towards the end of his description, he says that everything that went on here was accompanied by festivities so obscene that it's best to pass over them in silence. And, and I kind of wish he hadn't, but, but that's what we're left with. Old Uppsala is an important archaeological site located outside the city of Uppsala. Today dominated by three huge burial mounds, it was once the seat of Swedish kings and one of the most important religious, economic and political centers in Scandinavia. Okay, let's bust a few myths. Number one. All dead Viking warriors went to Odin in Valhalla, Valhall. That's not true. First, only the best of the warriors went to this special afterlife, and not all of them went to Valhall, the Hall of the Slain. Half of them ended up with Freya, chosen by her for her hall at Sesrumnir. This is what we get from the Eddic poems that, that contain a lot of our, our knowledge of Norse mythology. In fact, most people, men and women so far as we know, went to Hiel, which was not at all the bad place that it sounds like. It, it wasn't a Viking hell. Um, it seems that this is where the majority of all of them went. Myth number two. All the Valkyries were beautiful warrior women. That's not true either. That image comes from the later poetry and the sagas, the idea of uh, the Valkyrie as a sort of exciting subversion of medieval romance. If you go back to the Valkyrie's names recorded in the early poetry, the, the poetry sung by the scalds in the hall, they seem to be personifications of battle in its rawest, most terrible form. So their names mean things like uh, sword time, spear noise, uh, all kinds of words for, for, for terror and death and violence and loud noise, the chaos of a Viking battle. And these Viking Valkyries didn't, the original Valkyries if you like, they didn't swoop gracefully down onto a battlefield to carry away dead heroes. They were unleashed on it, personifications of just how bad Viking hand-to-hand -hand combat really was. Myth number three, 
that the Norse gods represented functions. Thor as the god of thunder, for example. Odin as the god of war. That's not true. They were not gods of anything. They were personalities. Odin was uh, the magician, the sorcerer, the inspiration for kings, the poet, the protector of outcasts, a lover, a seducer, a trickster, all of these things. Thor was strength, violence, war, yes, prosperity, all kinds of things. People would have identified with the personalities of the gods according to their moods, according to their needs, rather than their functions, which we have really put on them. The gods lived in Asgard, the, the, the place of the Aesir, the family of the gods, up in the sky, connected to our world by the bridge of the rainbow. Asgard seems to have been pretty much a kind of god-sized replica of the middle place, of the human world, but still quite distant. We should not think of, of people uh, praying to the gods all the time or, or going to regular rituals. Instead, for for most people of the Viking Age, it was much more common to interact with all the other creatures, the other kinds of beings with which they shared the world, this world, a kind of invisible population that's actually much more familiar to us today through folklore and fantasy fiction. Still at Gamlapsala, here we are on the other side of the Great Mound Ridge, and it's a good place to talk about the other inhabitants of the Viking mental world, because the people of the Viking Age shared their lives with an invisible population of beings and creatures and spirits, familiar to us today from folklore, the works of people like Tolkien, fantasy fiction, but in the Viking Age, very real. These are the elves, the dwarves, spirits of the land, of the rock, of the air, of the water, of the frost, of fire. Also trolls, ogres, all kinds of things like this. A, a teeming world of invisible beings. And actually, I think that it was this world that was probably more important to people in their daily lives than the larger, more distant world of the gods. So. I don't think you would have met Odin on a Saturday night, for example, but you'd have been very careful indeed to put some butter on that stone behind your house for the elves, to make sure that they, they would look after you, that they'd help your crops to grow, that your animals wouldn't get sick, all of these kinds of things. They also held special festivals, um, Alfablut, for example, a, a kind of offering rite in the halls, um, in other places too, to, to keep all of these invisible creatures on their side, to make sure um, that they would live in harmony with them. It's important not to see this as a kind of cosy nature worship. The natural world of the Vikings was a rather terrifying place. It was something they had to deal with, something they had to keep on the right side of if they wanted to prosper or even just survive. But it's something that lived a long while after the shift to Christianity, surviving in folk tales and stories, and even in some parts of Scandinavia today, uh, people still talk about the, the, the creatures in the forest, the, the things that live under the ground and so on. That part of the Viking world, the Viking mind, is still with us today. We're in the middle of the grave field of Valsjörda. It's a few kilometers north of Gamlöpsala, and it's a good place to think about the ancestors, the ancestral dead. This is a place where people have been burying their dead for hundreds of years before the Viking Age, and right the way through 
to the 11th century, the end of the Viking period, it was very important to be close to your family dead. People were buried around the farmstead, around the, the, the landscape of the farm. And what you get here is burial mounds marking generation after generation of the leading families of this area. And the interesting thing about this is that not everybody got a grave. We know that there's a significant proportion, academics argue about exactly how much, anything sort of 30% to 50% of the population, that doesn't seem to have received a permanent grave. So if you got a grave at all, you were an important person, you were someone to be remembered. And this idea of communicating with the past of your family, with your ancestors, is really important. So if not everyone becomes an ancestor, who does? Why? It seems that the ancestors are kind of role models for not only for, for living people, but perhaps almost for the dead as well. When you become an ancestor, you become part of that world of stories, the, the myth world that the Vikings constructed around themselves. Even Ardemar Bremen, when he talks about the, the, the gods being worshipped at, at Gamlapsala in the temple and so on, he says they also worship heroes who have become immortal. He's talking about ancestors. So even he understands that this, this ancestral dead are part of the world of gods, with the invisible population around them. They're part of this myth world. So people not only lived through it, lived in it, they died into it as well. And speaking of ancestors, on the ridge behind me are the great boat graves of Valsierda. If you've ever seen a cover of a book about the Vikings with a, a helmet on the front with, with elaborate decorations, it's probably not a Viking helmet at all. It's one from here. This is the centuries just before the time of the Vikings, so the, the, the late 500s, the 600s, the 700s. And along this line of the ridge, a, a series of boats dug into the side of the hill, facing towards the river just behind me. Boat graves packed with objects, with with weapons and armor, equipment from the hall, from the kitchen. Um, there's all these, uh, lots of animals sacrificed around them. They're like little, little dramas in miniature. If you, if you imagine how one of these graves was created, imagine a, a sort of funerary play, a, a piece of theater enacted at the graveside, each one telling a story, putting this dead person in this place at this time into that larger narrative of the ancestors, not only for the benefit of that dead person, but for the community that buried them as well. So that was just a few words, uh, uh, the, the tiniest window opening onto the world of Viking religion. It's one of my special fields, I, I think is one of the most exciting aspects of, of the Viking period. It's important to to, to correct misconceptions about Viking religion. It's also important to understand how much we don't know. And personally, I think the, the fewer illusions we have, nonetheless, the more exciting the, the mysteries that remain. There's lots more to know. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>